face so that our joy may be complete. Now understand this, at that time, at, the, um, at this time when the apostles were writing, writing was the highest form of um, technology, sending letters, writing and sending letters, highest form of technology. But we find that the apostle was saying, I would rather to speak to you face to face. Now we are even much better off than the apostles for in COVID time, we might not be able to speak face to face, but we can do what they call FaceTime. So connecting with people in a real, um, real time, we don't have to wait on a letter to be mailed, snail mails are kind of outdated. And so we can really do, uh, do that. So connect, seek to connect as much as you can connect with individuals, it is better than being glued to games and all of these things, all right? Play real games, do real things, all right? Now, second text, uh, Ephesians chapter five and verse 16 says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. So it says, we are to redeem the times for the days are evil. So um, I know many of our young people who spend ceaseless hours in gaming and in texting and in um, on, on um, TikTok and all of these different um, 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 sites. And they get hooked onto them, um, FaceTime, um, doing all of these things, and they lose out on really valuable time that they could be building up character and other things. Now, somebody might say, but Pastor, can we use the technology to build up character? Oh, yes, you can. But I promise you this, most of the times when we are on technology, Sad to say, it's not building us up, it is breaking us down. All right, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23 says, all things are lawful, all things are lawful. So as I said before, nothing is wrong um, with the technology itself, but something is wrong with how it is used and what areas of, um, of entertain the entertainment industry that we seek to listen to. So it says all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things are uplifting or not all things build up. And so we ought to be choosy, be picky with what you put before your eyes and in your mind. Proverbs chapter three and verse seven from the wise man Solomon says, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And so don't tell yourself, oh, I can handle it. I hear people say that all the time. I know this, I know that I can handle it. No, why would you take a little poison if you don't have to take any? Do not go where um, bad things are being done and do not um, seek to put negative things before your eyes if you don't have to, all right? Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 25 says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the days drawing near. So the more the days are drawing near, the more we ought to be encouraging each other in Jesus Christ. The more we ought to be spending time with each other instead of spending time gaming, doing all of these different things that we're doing. All right, go down. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. So whether you eat or whether you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. If the thing is not building up, it is breaking down. If the thing is not of God, it is of the devil. If the thing is not edifying, it is destroying. And so remember, seek to do things that glorify God on the telephone, on the internet, in, on the internet or any other pla on any platform that you're using. Ensure that you're doing what builds up and not what breaks down. Then because Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, let no corrupt talk come out. Hello? Hello? All right, final text. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the building up, for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear it. And so ensure that whatever you are doing is building up and not breaking down. Amen. Praise the Lord. I wonder if I have somebody trying to speak to me. Is there somebody? Did I hear a voice? All right. I'm going to proceed. All right. So today, my friends, we are looking at literally part two of um, uh, what we left off last week, but we are going on to the topic in New World Order, and we are um, 
tying these things together as it pertains to the rise of the Antichrist, the new world order, and how that affects us today. And we're going in our scriptures again, grab your Bibles, your Bibles, your Bibles, and we're going to be going, we're going to be going, my friends, to, we're going to be going to the book of, pan my camera a little bit better here, great. We're going to be going to the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel. Again, I just want to remind you, please, if you need to speak to me, unmute your mic, chip in anywhere, I will, I will stop. If you have a question or you want to make a comment, that's fine. Or if you want to type, that's that's great too. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, one and all. Let me see how many people are on now with us. Praise the Lord. And Balcom Drive, Seventh-day Adventist Church, they're also with us. They're linking in with us. And so we praise the Lord. Give them a big um, um, hail up for this Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. So go to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. So we're going to go Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to go Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. Let's go there. We're dealing with the new world order. First, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar had, a, had, had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So this is that what Daniel tells us, that Nebuchadnezzar had what? He had a dreams. His mind was troubled, the Bible says, and his sleep was gone from him, um, brothers and sisters. And so we find here a troubled king, a troubled king in um, Daniel chapter uh, 2. Look at what uh, chapter 2 verse 19 says. It says, during the night, uh, the mistress was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the Lord God of heaven. Now, the reason why I am really not going through the entire story uh, this evening is because we have gone through it before. So we know the story very clearly. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the ruling nation of the world at the time, uh, Babylon, uh, um, uh, that was considered to be a nation that could not be toppled, and its, it's king, Nebuchadnezzar, continue, considered to be a god uh, in his position as king. Here we find Nebuchadnezzar having a dream, but he could not, uh, he couldn't remember what the dream was, and he wanted to know. And so he called for the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and the magicians to come and tell him that dream, the book of Daniel tells us. But the Bible tells us that he, they couldn't tell him the dream. And so he said that he's going to slaughter every um, wise man in Babylon. The only problem with that is that uh, they had, Nebuchadnezzar had gone and pulled the ch children of Judah, children of Israel, from where they were, and they were now captive in Babylon. So Daniel and the wise men were there. Uh, Daniel and the the, uh, the the three Hebrew boys were there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so if he was going to kill all wise men, they would also die. Now, what does that mean? That means, I, I, I presented this this morning, as Abraham said, um, will the Lord, will the Lord um, destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? Now, the God of the earth will not do that. The God... Um, Jesus Christ will not do that, but definitely Nebuchadnezzar would have. And so guess what? Daniel and his friends prayed all night. Somebody said not all night service, prayer services are outdated. I beg to differ. They still work. And so they prayed all night, fasted and prayed. And guess what? As they did that, the Lord revealed in the night season, not just the dream, but the interpretation thereof. I'm going to take some of my water. Yeah, I have a whole a big um, cylinder uh, here. Carries fifty one. Uh, pardon me, one thousand five hundred and ten milliliters of water. Keeps it cold for twenty four and hot for twelve. Uh, drink your water, brothers and sisters. Keep healthy. All right. And so here they received the vision. Um, Daniel got the vision, interpretation of the dream. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31 to 35 says this, you saw, O king, and behold, a great image, the image mighty and exceeding, uh, exceeding brightness stood before you and, it, uh, and its appearance was frightening. Daniel was now explaining to the king as he went before him. It says in verse 32, the head of this image was of fine gold. Its chest and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs, um, um, in the King James Version, belly and thighs were of brass or bronze. And verse 33 says, its legs of iron and its feet, feet partly of iron and of miry clay or partly of clay. And then verse 34 says, as you look, a stone was cut out without, uh, without hand, um, 
uh, in King James, I'm going from um, the King James, was cut out without human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And so Daniel was here telling the king his dream. Now the king, I can imagine his eyes were wide open. Now, what was happening here? Babylon was the ruling nation of the world already. They had a, 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 a world order already, but God was saying some new stuff was about to happen. Verse 35 says, and then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold and all together were broken in pieces and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floor, um, floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel was here talking about a new world order, my friends, a new um, system of order that was coming. So Daniel will say, listen to me, King, Babylon, which started all the way from Genesis uh, with the Tower of Babel, my friends, from all back that time, Daniel was saying, guess what? All of that's going to be destroyed, and there will be a new order coming about. So Daniel said in verse 38 of chapter 22, thou art the head of gold. There are many theologians who have said, how do we know when, the, when, 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 to, when to start the prophecy and all of these things? Well, Daniel made it clear for us. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. And so we can follow through history, and we can know where we are in the image. All right, jump with me now, saints of God. If you have any questions, please throw them in the chat or unmute yourself and speak to me. If you have any uh, really juicy stuff that uh, you know from the presentation of the story or studying it yourself, please, we want to know. Please share with us. Um, prophecies have no private interpretation, so please share with us. All right, and so let's go to New Testament now. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46 through to 49. Luke chapter 6, 46 through to 49. We're speaking about a new world order, my friends. Watch this now. The Bible says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? This is important now. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Now, this can be asked of many a Seventh-day Adventist today. Many a Christian across Christendom today. Why do you call the Lord, Lord, and yet you do not do what he says? A Lord is somebody um, who has authority over you, who you ought to follow. And so if you call him Lord, then you must obey him. Verse 47 says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and do them, I will show you what he is like. Verse 48, it says, he is like a man building a house who digs deep and, lay, and lay, the foundation of, lay the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the streams broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been, what, well built. So my friends, God is saying, if we do not just call him Lord, but if we obey him, our foundations will be properly, will be properly set. And so we ought not just to say it, we ought to do it. Let's go on, 46 to 49. Um, it says this, 46 to 49, um, pardon me, verse 49 says this, but the one who hears and does not do them is like a what? A man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. And so we have to be careful. We're not just saying we are Christians, calling God Lord, but not being obedient. Which order are we following? Which order are we following? What order are we following? Are we following man's orders or are we following God's orders? Well, from the prophecy of Daniel, it tells you that um, Babylon was the head of gold. After the head of gold came the um, Medo-Persia, which is the chest of silver. After the chest of silver came Greece, which is the thigh, um, belly and thigh of brass. After Greece, after Greece came Rome, which were the legs of iron. And after the legs of iron came um, uh, after, um, pardon me, the leg, after the legs of iron came the feet of iron mixed with clay, which has divided Europe. And we are living in that dispensation right now, my friends. We are living right now in that dispensation. Revelation chapter 13, 
Revelation chapter 13. Come with me now. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3 says, And all the world wandered after the beast. Oh, pastor, you read this text so many times. Yes, because I want to make it crystal clear to all of you out there that in one way or the other, we are wandering after the beast right now. And so we ought to make our calling. We ought to search ourselves. You know, I think even us as some Adventists, we are sometimes very much misguided because we feel so self-assured, assured in our in our denomination, assured in our um, our theology, assured in our um, fundamental beliefs, assured in our doctrines uh, and church organization. When we ought to be searching our hearts, the pen of inspiration says we must turn the floodlight in, and we must do a hard searching. We must be like the prophet said, woe is me. So the Bible says the world shall wander after the beast, not some, but the world. And so we have been seeing it over and over from Pope John Paul. Uh, my friends, we have been seeing it, that the world was wandering after the beast. Post John Paul literally um, was an actor who became a pope. Isn't that interesting? That here was this um, really, you know, um, handsome gentleman and, you know, scholar, um, everything, and he became the Pope. And guess what Pope John Paul did? He rallied the world. There was a frenzy for Pope John Paul. As a matter of fact, they said he traveled so much crisscrossing the world, making um, connections and, and, and networks across the world for the Roman Catholic system. And so the Bible says the world wandered after the beast. So the papacy has gained worldwide influence and prestige and prominence for over the past um, few decades, my friends. Listen to what um, from the Oregon pro um, province, uh, this is Patrick Howell, um, and listen to what he was saying. This is captioned, Pope Francis, the first Jesuit Pope. I presented this to you before, and I tried to qualify it by telling you that he was not the first Jesuit Pope. He was just the first open, openly Jesuit Pope. Now, um, Father, uh, I don't want to call any of these people Father, but just for um, to be verbatim, or uh, just quote what he's saying. And it quotes Father Howell, rector of the Jesuit community, and the Jesuit community at the Seattle University will highlight some of the landmarks of Benedict's, of Benedict's um, eight years as Pope and talk about the election of, like election of Francis. I, the first Jesuit Pope, as well as the future of the Catholic Church. Isn't that interesting? So Pope, um, Pope, uh, <laughs> no, it's always interesting to me. Uh, now you have to sue with me. I am a, a kind of a word buff because here, Benedict, Benedict's name actually means end, you know, benediction. But then another came after Benedict. I want you to go uh, I read uh, Revelation chapter 17. And then another came after Benedict. And he's saying, listen, listen, I, uh, he, Francis now comes and says, the first Jesuit Pope, as well as the future of the Catholic Church. Oh, and this is coming from Loyola Jesuit Center. My friends, listen, we are in for some interesting times in Earth's history. We, uh, we followed through last time studying, and I shared with you that many of the founding fathers of the United States, which Revelation calls the lamb-like beast, that um, they, and many of them were Jesuits. I won't go back into that. And I qualified it also to say that whilst they were Jesuit, that does not mean that many of the things that they did weren't good, you know? And um, so, 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 but they were operating under certain paradigms and we have to be mindful of that, um, saints, that they were operating under certain paradigms. And it is for that reason that the foundation of the United States and how the United States has become was, it was, I would say it was um, carefully orchestrated, if I should put it um, that way. And that's why the lamb -like beast is doing exactly what it ought to be doing. The lamb -like beast, according to Revelation chapter 13, will return power unto the first beast. That's what the Bible says, saints of God. And so we are seeing that happening right before our eyes. Pope, um, uh, Pope Francis um, came after shortly after he was uh, he was he was elected to be the the Pope, and he did what he came to the 
most powerful country in the world, the United States of America. And before Republicans and Democrats, he had the bully pulpit of presenting what is the, uh, I, I would say, the, 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 the marching orders for the globe. And everybody accepted it. Bible says the world wanders after the beast. Now, I always like to um, clarify many of these things. Now, this is from New York Times. Times Magazine says, new world pope, new world pope. So they are identifying this man like never before. Pope John Paul was very, very popular. But never before you heard these things, these sentiments, and so many of them being presented. So Pope John Paul um, called the new world pope, the first pope from the Americas, uh, from Jesuit order to take name Francis. He's known to take the bus. And he's presented as being a simpler, humble man. Cook his own meals, have strong um, devotion to Mary, Marianism. I'll talk about that in soon to come. Marianism, visit the poor, be um, very spiritual, have low, um, uh, low, low key, uh, what do you call it? Low key style and love uh, soccer and all that. But all that, they are simply saying this is a humble man coming out of the, um, the, the brothers of Loyola, the Jesuit order, and he is the world pope. Can you imagine that? And so here is the lavish system of Babylon. Yet they say he is humble and he loves the poor and all of these things. The second Vatican Council or, um, and I um, apologize for this, I should have, uh, some of this is not showing very well, hopefully you can see it though. The Second Vatican Council, or informal, informally known as Vatican II, addressed relations between the Roman Catholic Church and the modern world. It was uh, the 21st uh, Ecumenical Council of the Catholic Church, the Council through the Holy See, formerly known under the um, pontificate of Pope John Paul the 13th and the, on the 11th of October, 1962. Now walk a little bit more, it says, and, it, and closed under the Pope, uh, Pope John Paul the, um, the sixth on the first of the ecumenic, on the first of the ecumenical conception, pardon me, first on the Immaculate Conception in 1965. Now this is um, Vatican II, the Vatican Council, where it was agreed upon by the Vatican Church in how they would operate uh, after this, after Vatican II. After Vatican II, their marching orders was that they must form allegiance with the world, world governments and so on and so forth, that they can now be blended into society. And there is where they became a much more evangelical um, church. And so the popes came and they followed the Holy See. Revelation 13 verse 18 says, here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His name, his number is 666, brothers and sisters. And so we must understand what we are relating to. We are relating to um, a, the devil's system that is led or that is um, whose agents agencies are man are human and so we know that men are the face of the enemy's agencies so god is has his agents and i hope each of us will identify ourselves as being agents of the king because the enemy does as his agents so we fall under the number seven seven means perfection it means flourishing it means purity and um, the enemy deals with six, 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 six. You know, you see them throwing up these these symbols and these things, and that is what the end, the number that the enemy comes under. This is one of the symbols for the enemy. You know, we see them coming up with these different hand signal symbols, and that is what they're seeking to do. So understand six, six, six throughout. Our revelation, the number seven represents perfection or completeness. The number six represents imperfection. Now, in theology, we call it the broken seven. That's what it is called many a times in theology. So the beast represents a false uh, religious system with human authority for the authority of Christ, man's tradition for God's words, substitutes laws, substitutes laws for God, 
for the commands of God and counterfeit Sabbath for God's true Sabbath. So that is what the enemy system is all about. I'm going to go back. Maybe I'm going a little bit fast and I want you to get it, my friends. I want you to get it. I want you to get it. Let me go over it again. Human authority for the authority of Christ. Do we see that? Oh, yes, we do. Where men are seeking to forgive sins. When Christ says he alone forgives sins, man's traditions for God, for the word of God, where the um, men are telling you that you must go and you must present your, 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 your confession to a statue when God's commandment says you ought not to bow down to any graven image. Substitute laws for God's commandments where we see um, uh, um, the, the very commandment is being restructured, um, brothers and sisters, uh, that to accommodate man's dogma. Then counterfeit Sabbaths for the true Sabbath, where Sunday is placed in is placed in the position of the Bible Saturday Sabbath. And so we are seeing this. But Daniel clearly said it. He says in Daniel chapter seven and verse twenty-five. Get some of my water and. They shall think to change times and laws, my friends. And they are going at it. They are going at it. There is attack on the family. There are attacks on all type of institutions that have to do with the church. First, they attack the commandments. And so Bibles were taken, pardon me, they attack the scriptures. So Bibles were taken out of schools. Their yeah, Bibles were taken out of schools. Then they attack the communication with God. So prayer was taken out of schools. Then you couldn't have no religious talk in schools. So to speak about your religion was um, enough to matter. You, wouldn't, you couldn't say that. Then after that was done, they then said um, that uh, commandments cannot be placed or put in public places. So all the courtrooms in the United States that would have the 10 commandments and even the statement on the dollar was attacked which says, uh, uh, in God we trust, all these things were attacked. So we see what the enemy is doing. Now, letter October chapter, uh, pardon me, letter October um, 28, 1995. And this is from C.F. Thomas. It says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So we know the change of these things is what um, the church believes to be her authority. Let me um, just and down a little, I want to make sure of a few things with you as we're going through this. All right, get in the right place with you. Okay, good. All right, so it says, so she believes that it was um, her ecclesia, it's a mark of her ecclesiastical power. What is the, what is, what is, what is really being said here? Remember, we are talking about a new world order. For you to have a new world order, you must first have control of what makes order in any society. Do you know what cause, um, what ensures order in any society? What ensures order in any society uh, is simply number one, it goes to the person who create the laws, and then number two, the law, um, the in enforced laws, um, ensure order in a society. So if God was in charge all this time, then, and his laws were written for you to take over authority or order, remember it's a one word order that they're moving to, from God, you must then dethrone God and start writing the laws. Does that make sense? All right, so God has his 10 commandment laws and man said, guess what? I'm smarter than God. So I am going to write the law. So Daniel prophesied it out long before in Daniel 7 and verse 25, where Daniel says, they shall think to change times and laws. Now, you must understand this, that when you search the Ten Commandments, only in the Fourth Commandment do you find a combination of times and law. Where the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, and so it comes down to a period of time. So the law is connected to a period of time. But if that is not enough, my friends, we are talking about a man's sign. A man's sign. In the Bible, we have two words that are used, sign and seal. And God says, and you can write these passages down. They are not on the screen, but use your Bible, use your Bible, use your Bible now. And test the pastor. You know, I don't have a problem being, um, being corrected. Now, 
the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12, and Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20, that the Sabbath is the seal or the sign of God. He says he shall put it upon his people. Hey, let's go there. Let's go there. We studied it about a few weeks ago, but I want to go there that it is fresh in your mind. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. I ain't going to even waste much time with you because we want to get through quite a bit of thing, stuff this evening. All right, let's go to 20. Let's look at chapter 12. It says, moreover, I also give them my Sabbath to be what? A sign between me and the, um, between me and between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So as a people, we are looking for sanctification. We are always talking about we are in the time of sanctification. And we do not know that it is through our relationship with God that we will be sanctified. Huh? God wants to place a signet upon each of us, which is his sign, the Sabbath. The Sabbath, brothers and sisters, is his actual name. And I didn't place, put this on the screen, but I'm going to tell you, you can test it for your very selves. In the word Sabbath, it is the only commandment that carries the very name of God. The word Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T-H, in the center of it. So in the center of the Ten Commandments, you find this, um, this command, remember the Sabbath. So God is literally telling you, you need to remember that I created you. You need to remember that I gave you this relationship from Genesis chapter 2. You need to remember that after you broke the laws and you drifted off as a people, I returned it. I came back um, um, for you at Sinai. And then he said to them again, remember. Why? Because he had given it to them from the book of Genesis. This was not from the Jews. This isn't a Jewish thing. This is actually um, something that was given before sin ever entered the world. Oh, man, let me read the, the next text in Ezekiel, and then we're going to go straight to Genesis, and I'll um, shore that up through scriptures. So let's look at verse 20. It says, hollow, hollow. This is important, you know. Many times we don't even read the text that is before it, but I'm going to read it with you. Go to verse 19. It says, I am the Lord, your God. So God is identifying himself. I am the Lord, your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Hollow my Sabbaths. And they shall be a what? Sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord, your God. So if you want to know who sanctifies you, it is the seal, the Sabbath. If you want to know who is your God, it is the seal, the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, we want to, sometimes we confuse the sealer with the seal. And so I hear New Testament Christians say, the Holy Spirit is the seal. The Holy Spirit is the sealer. He goes into you and he, and he seals the name of God upon the heart. So he's the sealer. He is the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the heart of righteousness and of sin and of judgment. He seals unto salvation. The seal is actually the very law, the commandment, the Sabbath. And if, all right, let me go back to Genesis. Come with me now to Genesis. Go to Genesis with me. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2. Now, you must understand that Genesis chapter 2 is literally um, God repeating what went on in chapter 1. Chapter 1 explained the, 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 the whole creation um, episode. And then Genesis chapter 2 picks up again. It then summarizes chapter 1, and it carries on to the rest of what happened uh, in the human experience. Now, watch this. In Genesis chapter 2, Look at verses one through to three. It says, then the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. So God ended his work right there. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And verse three says, then God blessed the seventh day. Now you must always watch repetition in scripture. Because repetition deepens impression, but it also sends a clear signal that the thing is important. God wants it to register in the mind. So you hear over and over God saying here, and on the seventh day, he could have said the Sabbath day, you know, but he didn't say Sabbath because the word Sabbath or Sabbath in Hebrew really means just rest. And they use it as just the word for rest. But watch this. He says on the seventh day, typifying time, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day. You see it being used again. From all his work, which he had done. 
go down now. It says, then God blessed the seventh day, third time, and sanctified it. You see, we read just about this in what? Ezekiel. Because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And so we find the first presentation here of seventh day rest. The word Sabbath in the very center of the word, you find the, when you say S-A-B-B-A-T-H, you find the word Abba, which is the name of God. And that's the seal. So the seal of God is very clearly in the fourth commandment and in the very word Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It sanctifies and it seals us that we are God's people. Now walk with me a little bit more because remember we said the enemy has a seal. And if one is going to create a new work order, he must dethrone, dethrone the old leader and then start writing the laws himself. Hmm? Now watch this. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that, um, that the change was her act and that the act is a mark of her what? Ecclesiastical. This word ecclesiastical really um, signifies of her um, literal church power, her ecclesiastical authority or power in religious matters. So she's saying, this is what signifies that we are in control or we have power on a religious level. Hmm? Now, we didn't write that, you know. Um, we're going to go on a little bit more. So Catholic records now, we're going to look at September 1, 1923. And the reason why... We you must understand how far back these things are coming from because a lot of people are acting as if these are new things. None of this is new, my friends. None of this is new. These are old developments that has been orchestrated. The pl plans have been hatched and they have been working it over time. Now, watch this, my friends. Right. We're entering in a little bit of deeper waters now. Just watch this. Sunday is our mark, and this is coming from Catholic Records, September 1, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this, at least you remember we read earlier, the significance of God's holy scriptures and also of the laws of God. But here is an organization, here um, is, a, is, is, an a, is, a, is, is the enemy's agency saying, they have more power. Sunday is the mark of their authority. The church is above the Bible. And the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So the transference, the movement of the, uh, of the um, solemnity of the Sabbath, as God presented it in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through to 3, that sanctification and that um, setting apart that God did. They said they are above the Bible. They changed that. And you know why? Because remember, earlier we read it. Uh, we read it earlier where it says that they have ecclesiastical authority and they're above God. They're above the Bible, my friends. So we find them saying here, the church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Why could the Sabbath be proof of that fact? Have you ever considered that? Why is the Sabbath? Why not um, some other change that they have made being proof? Do you know why the Sabbath is proof of that fact? Because in the center of the Ten Commandments is God's signet, signet mark. This is the proof of God's authority, my friends. This is the connection. This is what seals us to God and God and us and God to us. And Paul made it clear. He says, I am a slave to the gospel. He says, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. As if to say, Jesus bought him. And as black people, we know a little bit about uh, a little bit about that, uh, what it means to be bought. It's an ugly picture, but it's it 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 it, it makes the message clear. You see, saints, we first were um we first were governed by god when we were created in the book of genesis i know I i'm not gonna get into the black and the white thing because i strongly believe based on um theological studies that adam and eve were of a more uh, uh, <laughs> had more of this type of complexion than a lighter complexion and i can tell you why don't want to go off now on some rabbit uh, in some rabbit hole, but I can tell you why. Adam's name, the very name Adam or Adam in Hebrew means ruddy or reddish or reddish dirt. 
And so what, what it means is like when, he, when you look at red dirt, his, his complexion was more like this instead of um, very tan and very um, clear, you see? Now that, that is just for his name. His name also means that he holds a propensity to reproduce humanity, you know? And I can go into the uh, biological part of that too, but I'm just saying, Adam and Eve, after God created them, he utilized the Sabbath to make a connection between him and them. And here they are now utilized. They are saying, we're gonna move the solemnity from the Sabbath. And by moving that, it proves that we have authority because the hinge pin of God's law is actually the Sabbath. And so my friends, we find that Roman Catholicism pulling from all type of paganism, uh, be it um, um, the, uh, um, from, the Sumeri um, from the Sumerians and um, others of old times from even the Egyptians and all of those from old times. We find brothers and sisters that know they are utilizing the same things in their theology or in their um, um, liturgy and they are now selling this to the world. What am I talking about here? Well, sun worship number one. And so you see them worshiping the venerable sun and they removed, uh, they, 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 on, they worship on Sunday. See, really speaking to the fact that they honor or they venerate the, um, the sun god. Uh, and this is coming from old Babylonish, um, Sumerian and um, uh, um, Egyptian, and uh, even from, from um, Baal um, worship, my friends, and we spoke some to the, some of that already. So we have all of these set situations happening and it's coming to a head under Roman Catholicism. Now, watch this. So where did this worship of Mary comes from or Marianism? So we find coming from Babylon and Sumeria also, and from Nimrod and Tammuz. So that as, the, as it is said uh, in, in the history, that um, Nimrod, who is called the sun god, after he died, he was called the sun god, um, that he entered the heavens. This is the, 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 the fable that was told by his wife, Surinamis. He entered the heavens, and it is said he became the defender. And what she said was that she was impregnated by a sunbeam, and she had Tammuz. Tammuz was then born on uh, the winter solstice, which is... Uh, what we call today um, Christmas. And that is why um, even up to this day, uh, Christ's so-called birthday is celebrated on the 25th of December, which is not so, when you study the Jewish calendar and Jesus's birth. However, we find that mixed up into Marianism and Marianism came from um, Babylonia, Babylon, um, the Babylonish um, belief in, Nam, in Nimrod, Tammuz and Surinamis. And so this is literal Marianism, my friends, and sun worship. Uh, Nimrod was called the sun god or the great, um, the defender, all right? And this whole worship of mother and child coming all the way back, you know, halo and all, you know? And that's where the skull cap comes and all of those different things. And so we are seeing sun worship coming all from all the way back up until today. This is Marianism in its fullest. And you know what's interesting about it? You can find Marianism in all the major religions of the world. And I'll talk about that at another time, but it is in, it is in um, Islam, it is in Christianity, it is in Buddhism, you'll find it everywhere. And you'll wonder why is it so prevalent? Why is it so important? And we will talk about that at another time. But my friends, we see this, the worship of Mary. Isis, Oris, um, Ishtar, all of these names comes from the same thing, sun worship, sun worship. Uh, they are trying to gain a new world order. And how are they trying to do it? They're trying to dethrone God, start, um, take the throne up, dethrone God, start writing the laws or changing the laws of God. All right, history. Uh, uh, let's go back to the history books. It says pagan ceremonies were established in Christian churches until Christianity exhibited so, so exhibited so grotesque, uh, so grotesque and idiots a form that its best features were lost, and its early loveliness altogether destroyed. 
And so this was a gradual, as the history um, books tell us, this was a gradual thing that came into the church and ultimately we lost the very image of what God was. And so sun worship again from all of the different places, Egypt, Isis, Oriya, Scandinavia, Phrygia, and, and, Bal, and, and Balar, um, Rome, Venus, and Adonis, Babylonia, Ishtar, and Tammuz, um, and, 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 and we find Baal and, and Ashtoreth. Uh, so we know that all most major systems, human, so, human societies had these belief systems, my friends. So it's nothing new. The enemy has been preparing a new world order uh, long before this, long before this, my friends. And so we, we see it happening over and over. And we discussed this already, the sundial and how uh, St. Peter's Square in Rome, in the Vatican is prepared. It is a, literally, it is a Jesuit preparation where it is a sundial and it is, it is really calculated. Every part of it is calculated where, where at different points of the day, the, 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 the beams of the sun will hit certain places and all of that. You know, there are pagan symbols put up that are now given Christian names you know, and nothing about it is Christian, really. And so we have to be mindful um, of those things. And does anyone have the mark of the beast today? No, my friends, no one will um, has the mark of the beast. And until there is religious legislation or an enforcement of, uh, sun, of Sunday observance opposed to Sabbath, then you will see the mark of the beast, my friends. Remember, 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 be very clear in your minds that there is a new world order. There is an organized um, system afoot. There are people who are seeking to establish this, but it is not yet. What does the future hold? Well, the Bible predicts a coming confederacy of religious of religions attempting to unite church and state. Now, guess what? We're seeing this already. This is out there already. We are seeing the systems moving in the United States to enforce um, religious systems moving in the United States to enforce uh, religious laws upon society. This is already happening and they are using it under the various guise, the guise of, um, of, um, of, of, of global warming and other areas, but we are seeing it. We are seeing the connections being made, networking being made uh, with the um, the Holy Mother Church and all the various different denominations and religions around the world are rallying to the Mother Church. And remember this, Revelation says this is the Mother Harlot. It's not just that it's a harlot, but it's that it is a mother, meaning that there are children. And so all the world wandering after the beast is that the children of Rome are going back home, my friends. And so we are seeing this now more than ever. We're seeing this now more than ever. We're seeing it from East and so, so the East, from the Eastern faiths, we're seeing the Buddhists and the Islamic and all of the, the Sikh and all of these different um, groupings going now to Rome. We're seeing it in the Baltic areas of Russia where we're seeing um, the Baltic churches coming back home. We see it in, 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 in the Western world uh, where the Church of England, even the Lutheran Church is now signing treaties with Rome. We're seeing the evangelical churches in North America signing over treaties to Rome. We're seeing it all over the place. And let me put this out there as an Adventist pastor, as a preacher of the three angels' messages, as one who fears God, as one who exalts um, um, truth, as one who believes Un, um, unreservedly that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. There are many people out there saying, saying and promoting that, oh, the Seventh-day Adventist church has signed treaty with the Roman. This is not true. This is not true. My friends, uh, are we perfect? Far from it. Do we work with um, even the Catholic church on various um, things that are of social good? Many times, you know, people in Jamaica still go to food for the poor and they still get food for the poor, houses for poor people. Even us as pastors, we still, to assist the, um, the, 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 the public, will um, um, address uh, different 
institutions like this, we are not opposed to working or assisting people in society. And we are not opposed to even um, speaking to and having good relations with um, a priest or whoever, but we have not signed any, uh, any, any um, agreements or contracts or ecclesiastical documents with the Catholic Church. And so I had to put that out there and make that crystal clear for those who are putting falsehood out there, you know? So um, we are seeing already the formulation and the development of um, this cult organization, this one world order. Uh, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun and we are seeing that before our very eyes. And so on your, my left, um, I, of the screen, you'll see a representation of the Babel Tower, the unfinished Babel Tower. You will see in the middle, that is the EU Parliament building in Strasbourg. And this is how they built it. They built it as an exact replica of the um, unfinished Babel Tower. And then when you look at your extreme right, you will see now um, what is on the, mag the front of the magazine. Uh, Europe, many tongues, one voice. Many what? tongues is as a representation of the Babel Tower when God um, sought to confuse the tongues. And so this is where uh, the world had many tongues. But listen to what Europe is saying. No, we are, we are still opposing God. We are many tongues, but one people. As a matter of fact, there is a plaque, I believe, there where they said um, um, that they are building the tower, but this time they will finish it because they are alluding to the Babel Tower that was not, was incomplete back then in Genesis, because God confused the languages. Isn't that, it, you talk about flying in the face of God, huh? So that's what they said, Europe, many tongues, one people, you know. Um, let's go on a little bit. So we started speaking a little bit about the Black Pope last time, um, uh, Adolphus Nicholas, and we saw here, and I have a picture at the bottom there that relates to that relates to a picture at the bottom that relates to um, the reaction of South America to the coming of Pope Francis. Now, what you must understand that there has always been, and this, you know, Catholicism in South America is, is really big, really, really big, but um, when at the coming of Pope Francis, the exiting of Pope Benedict and the coming in of Pope Francis, there was an hysteria. There was a great hysteria. People really were fired up about this new Pope and to the extent that the Times Magazine says he was the world Pope. And so out went Benedict and here came a brand new Pope. Here came a brand new Pope. And so However, I wanted to make it very clear that while you see these white popes coming in and going out, you what you don't normally see is that uh, behind the scenes, there are black popes like um, Pope uh, Adolphus Nicholas, which is called the black pope. It's not because he's a black man or because he wears black and normally, typically the white popes wear white and the black popes wear black, but that's not um, really it. It is that the black pope is the pope that works behind the scenes. The black pope is a pope that works behind the scenes. He is the face that of the Catholic Church or the Vatican that we typically do not see, but he is the one that is nor he's normally pulling the strings and doing um, a lot of the the, the 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 work behind the scenes to ensure that the work of the white pope, which is the face of the Roman Catholic Church, gets done around the world. And so you want to keep that in mind. I remember what the Bible says, he calls it all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves are free and born to receive the mark on their what, right hand or on their foreheads. That no one might may buy or sell except, no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation chapter 13, verses 6 through to 16 through to 17. Now you're going to find that this this is a religious. This is a religious and a, um, a economic presentation where you are finding that it is literally saying that if you do not have the mark of this religious system, you will not be able to buy or sell. 
So you can't have livelihood, you can't have health care, you can't own a house, you can't own land, you can't hold a job, you can't go to school, you can't do any of these things, save you, save, uh, if you do not have the mark. My friends, we are getting there. When I hear rhetoric from the government, like they're gonna use the armies to, um, to, 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 to vaccinate and these things, we're getting there. I am not saying that the vaccine is the mark of the beast, um, I am not saying any of that. I do not know what the vaccine is. Um, the only thing I would say as a person who believes in the um, health message and holistic health is that you have to be mindful of what is placed in the vaccine, what is going into your body that you better be mindful of, my friends. And so um, it is not far-fetched. They have done much more nefarious things in the past. And so I would say be careful. However, you know, the Bible tells us that the mark of the beast is a decision that every person will have to make in relation to who you worship. So keep this in mind. Follow me now. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. He was granted, Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. He was granted power to God. Give breath to the image of the beast. Now I want you to listen to these words carefully. You know. I'm going to go back. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, or free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand and or in their foreheads. No, and they cannot do anything outside of having this mark. Watch this now. Then it says in verse 15 of same chapter 13 of Revelation, it says this, it says this, it says, um, he was granted power to give birth to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. This is the enforce, this is enforcing um, uh, Catholicism, enforcing man's laws above God's laws, enforcing it with penalty of death. This is the time when worshiping on Sunday becomes the mark of the beast, my friends. So keep these things in mind. Keep these things in mind. At this time in Earth's jungle, in Earth's jungle, we need to know these things. It is important that we know these things. We're coming down to an end. All right. All right. Our historic freedom will be challenged, and we are seeing that already. Listen to what the apostle says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Acts chapter 5 and verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. I think this is something we need to say every day to ourselves. We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. My friends, we are at the end. We are at the end. It is time we follow God. It is time we follow the Almighty God. The enemy is seeking to overthrow God. The Bible says in Thessalonians that the Antichrist, the son of perdition, sitteth in the throne of God, calling himself, that, saying that he is God, and opposing all that is God's. And so we find this system, this agent of the enemy, now behind the scenes and now before our very faces, writing new laws and saying that they are God. This is what you call a new world order. However, remember what Daniel says, that the image will be destroyed by a stone cut out without hands. And it says, and that image, and that the, all the nations shall be swept away by a wind. And then that stone will become a mighty mountain and it shall last forever, which is the kingdom of our God. We give God thanks and we give him praise. My friends, it is time that we fall in the hands of our God, following him, whether soever he goeth. We're going to stop here for today. I hope you are edified. We will continue to dig scriptures in preparation for Jesus' second coming and to prepare the minds, prepare the minds of our people that they will follow God rather than men. I ask you to close your eyes with me at this moment. If we have no questions, we have no questions, but I invite you to close your eyes with me as we will pray, giving God thanks for his words. Oh, prophecy is great. Prophecy is sure, my friends. 
And I hope that you were edified this evening. God be praised. And thank you for joining me. Wherever you are joining from, or uh, wherever around the world, please text in your name and where you're joining from. And I would love to keep on studying with you each and every Sabbath evening. God bless you. And thank you again. We're getting prepared right now for AYS. And we're going to be turning over to AYS coming shortly. Let's have a word of prayer, everyone. Eternal Father, God, we thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your keeping care and for following and for the fact that we can we have a God that we can follow, scriptures that continues to direct us. I pray now, dear Jesus, that as we end this Bible study, it will be edifying to our people and it will be life-changing. But also they will be inspired to study more in preparation for your soon return. Bless our young people and the upcoming program. In Jesus' name we say thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you again, everyone. Thank you for joining me this evening on the Bible Unsealed with Pastor Christopher Atkinson. For those who are joining me from other places around the world, for the Balcom Drive folks joining me on that link, thank you for joining me. And for other um, churches and folks around the world, thank you for joining me. God bless you and continue to serve the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I'm gonna turn over to our AY as they make preparation for their special program this evening. To God be praised. See you soon, see you next week. All right, I'm still checking. Uh, so one person is writing. And you can still drop your comments. I'll still get them um, even after Bible studies is, after we're finished with Bible studies. So still drop your comments and I'll still get them. God bless.
For our Adventist Youth Program this afternoon, our program will be spearheaded by our education department here at Washington Gardens. And the nature of the program today, it's refreshing ourselves while we go into this pandemic. So we will have some special features and we will be educated on how we cope and how we go about going forward while working through this pandemic. The flyer is now on the screen, right? And we will have a special guest presenter. So at this time, I will just hand over to our education director, Sister Kareen Goscott. Good evening, AY. Making career decision can be overwhelming, but with the Lord's guidance, it is not insurmountable. Whatever the nature of the job, whatever we plan to do, the first thing we should be doing is to seek the Lord's guidance. Psalm 32 verse 8 states, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way thou shalt go. I will guide thee with that mine eyes. The Bible is not a manual or a career planning making decision, but it does teach some important principles that can assist us as Christians in becoming a wise decision maker. What are those principles? For example, principle, this principle encourages us to have our priority in life, always to develop an increasingly intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Another principle that should guide how we make our decision says God has created you with an aptitude for particular skills and abilities and with the inclination toward particular interests. So the Bible has some guidelines that we need to follow, that we should follow as Christians. So this evening, as we share with you on the topic, reshaping for the new normal. We will encourage you to listen and we trust that for this young person who may have chosen a program of study to, uh, to go to university in September, some may be going to the world of work, whether it be vocational training or academic, whatever it is. Some persons may have lost their jobs because of COVID. Some persons are still working, but reduced hours. Some have lost business. Whatever it is, our hope this evening is that you'll be inspired to get some information that can help you and to make you know that you're not alone. Over to you, Sister Yannick. Good afternoon, Washington Gardens. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, viewers online, on Facebook, on Zoom, on YouTube. We are so happy to have you with us this afternoon. As you were told before, the education department of the Washington Gardens Church will be front and center this afternoon as we explore the theme reshaping for the new normal. What is the new normal? How do we reshape? 
This afternoon, we'll be having, first of all, a panel discussion, and we have some self-employed persons, business owners with us, and they will be helping us to explore how we can reshape for the new normal. I have to my left, Sister Doreen Zimenez. She is the Director of Logistics, Purchasing and the Procurement at the Kestrel's Industry, Kestrel Industries Limited. Um, to my right, I have Sister Janeth Spencer. She is a designer, dressmaker, who works from home. She will be speaking with us as well. We have the old lone gentleman here, Brother Mark Patterson. He is the owner CEO of Auto Parts and Diagnostic Solutions. And he will be sharing his perspective this afternoon. Welcome one and all. Okay, now I'm going to ask um, as we begin, just uh, for each person to just give a little synopsis of what their operations are. Um, do you work alone? Do you have many employees? Do you have few employees? Um, what are your day-to-day -day operations like? Sister Zimenez? A very good afternoon to you. As was told before, I'm Doreen Zimini. I am a director of Kestrel's Industries. We operate from two warehouses, one from 125 2nd Street and one from 46 First Street. We're importers of basic food items, such as rice and peas and corn, cornmeal out of Belize, and we do some meats out of Australia, like the mutton and so forth and so on. And we have 30 employees and three directors. Thank you, Sister Zimney. Sister Spencer? Yes, I'm Janet Spencer. I'm a designer, seamstress, slash dressmaker. I operate from my house. Um, and I work alone most of the times, but at times when I may need some help, I'll employ one person to help me out, but mostly I work alone. You don't have any specific operating hours? Yes, I do start from as early as eight o'clock because you, even though I work from home, I have to be disciplined as to how I operate because it is a business and uh, I wake up like like at three or four o'clock sometimes in the morning to get my devotion out of the way and then I can start sometimes I start at six o'clock depending what I have to do what I have to get out but my basic starting time is about nine o'clock and I go up until about five and beyond sometimes. But my basic start time is between nine and five. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Brother Patterson. Yeah, my name is Mark Patterson. Um, the owner of Auto Parts and Diagnostic Solution and there's a sister company, PH Acquisition and Maintenance. What we really do is importation of cars, and parts, we do auto repairs, and we do um, auto diagnostic, right? That is the main core for business. Okay, do you work alone or? Do no, you don't work alone? alone. I have three employees and one partner. Okay, all right. So we have a general idea of what, of what the operations are like. All right, can you tell me now, how has COVID affected your, your normal operations? What it used to be like and what it is now? How have you been affected by COVID-19? How has your operation, business operation, been affected by this pandemic? So we'd go in the same order, Sister Zimenez. Well, COVID has 
open our eyes. It has opened our eyes to that of how we should operate. We, we are by the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Industries and the various agencies, but now we have to be we have to ensure that our employees first they have to wear masks. Secondly, they have to be sanitized before entering the building. And the clothes that they wear to come to work in transit can be worn in the warehouse. And we find it very difficult, difficult, difficult for them to adhere to wearing the mask, to sanitize as often, and to social distancing. We have a very hard task. So we have to be like drill sergeant in the warehouse to tell them, put on your mask. And we have to be very careful because every now and again, the various inspectors come, along, come around. So we have to do what we have to do. Thank you, Sister Zimri. How is COVID affected how you operate? Well, because I work from home and I don't have a staff, I, it has not impacted me so badly. But in the beginning of COVID, things were quite normal. And then after lockdown and everybody you know, has to um, have to start wearing masks and all of that. So even the week when it was announced that there's going to be an island-wide lockdown, I had some things that I were doing and I still have some of them now. Persons would call me and said, Janet, we're not going anywhere, so you know, it makes sense to come pick up. So, um, so even now I have some of the things. Some persons came afterwards and pick up. And for about two going to three weeks, there was nothing happening. And I had to go into, you know, my, my, my little stash that I had put down. And then I started, I prayed and I said, God, how is this going to work out now? Because nobody is happening, nothing is happening. I'm just sitting here. And I prayed about it. I talked to God and things started turning around a bit. Lord. Yeah. Praise because, can I go? Go ahead. Yeah, because... Um, what most persons, and when you listen to a lot of persons or everyone in my field, they will tell you that this is what they turn to. And this was my lifeline. And, uh, you know, one night um, after praying about it and a few days passed, I woke up one morning about one o'clock and I was there, you know, meditating. And uh, the, the spirit said to me, why don't you do some mask? And I said, Hmm, who am I going to sell it to? Uh, nobody's asking me for masks, what I'm going to do with it. So I just dismiss it. And uh, about one o'clock in the afternoon, I saw a message on my phone. Janet, do you do masks? We have a company of about 140 persons we would like to. Praise so um, yeah, so I sent some samples of, of the few that I did before, did not hear from that person. So I just dismiss it. And then a church sister called me and asked me if I do them. And I said, no. And she said, then why don't you do it? And so I dismiss it. And the following day, people started calling me. So I had to get busy. I had to, whatever fabric I had at home was just finished. And then I had to go and get fabric. And thanks be to God, this was my lifeline throughout. Okay, thank you, Sister Spencer. It might sound ridiculous, but was mask making a part of your your day to day activity? Never, before? never, because okay. even at home when I'm cleaning and dusting, I just um, stitch up a, a, a thing or two because sometimes, depending on the fabric that I have to use, that I use, that I'm working with, I have to wear a, a dust mask. So I have two that I just wash and put on. And so when it came, no, I had to to go to pencil and pen and start designing. And, and fit myself and, you know, try to perfect okay. it and fit on my son and try to perfect it until I okay. got it right. Very good. So you actually are embodying our theme, reshaping yes, yes. for the new normal. So you had to adjust. I had to adjust. But why you never just continue to make uniform and clothes? Because there's nobody to back <laughs> okay. up. Okay, you backing. had to adjust <laughs> yes. your operations. Yes. Thank you so much, Sister Spencer. Yes, Brother Patterson. 
All right. Um, COVID doesn't really, didn't really affect me based on what I do. Um, I would tell anybody that I do not like mechanic work, but my father tell me if I do anything else, I can't come to the yard. Because what means a vehicle now stop running? Vehicle will always be running, right? So although I do it, I don't really like it, right? But as you say, anything we do, you have to do it to the best. But what happened when, when COVID, I, I, I classified, my, classified myself as an essential worker. Because what happened, I mostly work on trucks. And because trucks have to go out and do delivery, they always break down. You understand? They break down and they go want parts. And what I do, I import parts from Japan. So people call me. So I, I, I couldn't take, say, take leave like everybody's talking about COVID and then can't go to mingle. I have to be there because they are looking out for me. Okay. So what about the sanitization policy? Right. What I do, what I did, I, I schedule the works. Like somebody would have, like, I would, people would call and make the appointment. So I don't take in a crowd. Right? So if I, if I give you a date, you need to come. So don't call me tomorrow and tell you, say, I, I, did, I, I couldn't get to come yesterday, so you won't come today. No, you lose that appointment. Okay, so you do appointments. So you right. sanitize. Right. What so about somebody mask have a, a temperature gauge and a sanitizer, a spray bottle. So each time anybody come in, basically take the temperature, spray them, and then you're good to go. Okay, thank you so much. So you're saying that you actually benefited from right. COVID because we are all affected. You benefited. And Sister Spencer is saying the same thing. You benefited. Praise the Lord. Sister, Sister Ziminez, what about you? I sell basic foods. Okay. So, so people eat everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the okay. rice and the cornmeal and okay. uh, a number of persons were, everybody was at home. So the trucks were going and the calls were coming. Okay. So, right. so COVID-19 was a positive for your business operations. Okay. Um, what I are don't like that because it's, it, it, we, we, we benefited, but it is not a positive. Okay, I take your point. Okay, now many persons, even though you were still operating during COVID, you were not staying at home and not doing anything. You were busy. What about those who have lost their income, lost their job? As employers, what advice do you have for these persons? Say they worked in the hotel industry. What advice do you have for them? They cannot be a hotel manager anymore because they are closed. How would you advise them in seeking employment or as Sister Spencer said, adjusting and delving or moving, transitioning into other areas within that same field, or maybe another area altogether. How would you advise these persons? Sister Zimenez? What we must think of and know right now that the qualifications are different. Um, people can't say they are specialists in this or specialists in that. The only area that you can be specialist in, I would say, is IT. We have to rethink our skills. We have to look. The paradigm has shifted because they say even doctors are are have to now apply for the for a position and and the and the lawyers now they have outgrown their numbers but people who are young people who are looking to get a profession please don't leave out the IT section you have to be technical in the on the computer I don't know how to tell because, as I said, there is a paradigm shift, and I am not so acquainted with what the managers of hotel, what they do. 
and because of the lockdown and people are even saying there is a, an impending lockdown to come because of the numbers that are going. I really don't know how to answer that, Miss Sister Patterson. All right, ma'am. Sister Spencer. Well, um, persons, everyone's situation is different. And there are persons who may not be, um, is, um, may not, not have a skill or they might be just, um, just, um, what did I say? They are, it, they, they just have one um, career path, profe right. profession. They just have one profession. And uh, when they are laid off, some persons who were laid off, they would have, some of them would have had a skill that they turned to, a skill that is needed. But for those who really don't have a second, you know, what can I say? All, all I did was talk to God talk to God about it. Okay. But if, if your skill can take you somewhere or you may have an idea that you would want to work on, the time that you are sitting at home, because I assume some persons are gone out, some persons are still at home. If you have an idea that you have been toying with for a, for a while, try as best as possible and see if you can go into it or tap into it. But most of all, never forget to put God at the forefront Amen. of the picture because only he can lead you into, into the correct path. Okay, thank you. So you're saying that it is advisable for persons to have a skill. To have a skill. To have more than one career yes. path. Yes. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much. Brother Patterson? All right. Um, learn to accept changes in life. Yes. I, I remember when I just started out, I started out on auto parts shop and everybody know like about the whole of cars and B13, A100. Those are old cars where everybody used to want to run as taxi. And it reached a stage where those cars get outdated. So I realized that the parts was there, but basically them now sell again. So what I did, I just packed them up and put them on the veranda because that not going to help me. You understand me? You can't wait till you have a business and when it dry you down, mash up, you decide to change. You have to look and see the changes, right? Then while I was there, I realized that as a mechanic, um, motor vehicle was going basically electronics. Most vehicle that you have now is computer generated. So what I did, I first thing I did, I buy a scan tool. The scan tool almost cost me over half a million dollars. Most mechanic would say that is too much money to invest in a diagnostic machine, right? But at the same time, you cannot fix a vehicle now without a diagnostic machine. What happened? If you have a vehicle, one time gone, if you have a vehicle broke down, you'll call a mechanic. No, if you have a vehicle broke down, you have to call either a wrecker or a technician. You know, as the vehicle broke down a road again. So you have to look and see changes that is taking place. What happened now, you have vehicle that is conventional combustion engine. They are making them now hybrid. So half is electric and half is mechanical. Now they are moving away from hybrid and they are going fully electric. So you have to do what you have to do. Because what I'm, we do not design any vehicle in Jamaica, right? We import everything. So basically, you, you can't look at local news and look what is happening. You have to look at what is happening in the industry. Because what they say, in, 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 in the next 10 years, 2030, is basically IT is going to take over everything. Machinery. So your job, where you say that work around factory, that is not going to be in anymore. They're going to be machine for everything. So you have to look, see changes, and learn to adapt. Okay, thank you so much, Brother Patterson. Brethren, we are hearing, we're hearing that we have to learn to accept changes. We have to research and look ahead. We have to treat our business as a business. 
you're not hustling, even if you're operating from home. It is a business and you have to be professional about it. We're hearing that we have to be computer savvy or computer literate in this age. Now, I have brother Elder Dale Flynn online. I'd like to bring in Elder Flynn. Are you there, Elder Flynn? Can you hear? So I'm going to invite him to participate in our discussion as well. As we wait for Elder Flynn, I'll share a, a quotation I read a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago. It says in his book, Future Shock, Alvin Toffler wrote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Did you hear that? The illiterate will not be those who cannot read or write. But if you cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. My sister has often said to me, um, employers are not so much concerned about the number of degrees they are concerned that you are teachable, that uh, you can navigate in whatever position you are placed in in the, in the company. Um, while we wait for Elder Flynn, um, panelists, how true is that for your organization? Anybody can jump in. I find that very instructive. You will find you have a, a potential person you're interviewing and they come with a full scalp paper of the amount of degrees and skills and and you're enthused but you give them a simple task I, I don't they can't think on their feet you said where did you go and they tell you which university they are. And, and there was even one person would say, write their name with honors. And you give them a simple task. No, 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 no. And you would probably take somebody who very well at high school, didn't come with any subject, with any subject, yeah. But you give them a simple task and you ask them and then you are surprised. So that quotation is very true okay. and profound. Thank you, Sister Zimenez. Yes, I, I agree with Sister Zimenez because you know one of the reasons I work alone is that it's really, really hard because I mean, doing a garment is not as easy as you see it. it. It looks good on you. But I was told once by um, someone, it was my, my, um, my aunt's husband. He said, there's an art in everything. I was told that when I was 17 years old, that time I did not start anything yet. And I remember that until this day, there's an art in everything. And even in my field where I work, it is hard to find someone who can put out quality work because I pride myself on what I do. I appreciate your business. I respect that you can call me and say, Janet, do this for me. I am collecting your hard earned money. I want it because this is my business. So when I give you a piece of garment to put on, you must be pleased. When you turn it on the inside out, you must be pleased with what you get. I don't want anybody to leave my place and then frown. 90% of my business is not advertising, it's word of mouth. Somebody sees somebody with a piece, something on them, and where did you get this done? And it okay. is circulated. So, you know, it is important that you, you, you learn, as you said, and uh, you don't frown when somebody, you make a mistake and somebody point this out to you, 
and you accept that you have made a mistake and you 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 know you correct it because you want perfection okay right. thank you so much brother Patrick. all right um that statement is so true i remember i was interviewing a guy that that came to to work with me and when i asked him what he can do yeah man i can do everything man i can do everything um no. my father is a mechanic and he can do everything and what about me said well let's see right so when he wants to start work, I'm saying we come to work the next Monday or whatever. So the first thing that car was there to service. So I say, um, you can join the aisle on that car. He might ask me where the bung is, where the aisle drain is. You understand me? So right there and there, you know what type of staff you have. So he said that he could you do, do it. He do it. Like so so basically, I'm ass assessing him by giving him a simple task. Okay. So right? So what um, you're saying that it is difficult to find good workers, is yes. that what you're saying? Right. And okay. sometimes you have to take a stand because I have even another staff when he just came, I was telling him how to do the work, but him feel like that is how it is supposed to be done. And while he was doing it, like the spanner touched at the band and there was a spark. And when I was talking to him, he was frozen and whatever. So I tell him, say, well, all right, then you want me. Since you are work with me and if anything happens, a customer won't call him. They will call me. So you want to go in the yard until you know what you want. Then you can check me back. It takes him two weeks to come back. And when he calls, all, what he said is, I talk to him too hard. And his father never talked to him so hard. Yes, you can call it. You understand? So basically, I guess he go home and he's looking at himself. And he's the best person I have now. Thank you, Brother Patterson. So it is difficult to find workers. What advice do you have to young persons now who they are experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic? What advice do you have for them in, in, in choosing careers, in choosing subjects for a career? I have here another quotation. Um, not only is there the reality that machines will take over jobs humans do today, but according to Dell Technologies and Institute for the Future report, 85% of the jobs in 2030 don't exist yet. It's 10 years very, old. very shocking to hear. Structured education can no longer end after leaving school or college. Education must become a lifetime, a lifelong endeavor, and sources of education need to evolve to provide these opportunities. So according to this research, some of the jobs that we see now, I hope it doesn't mean my job, but some of the jobs that we have in today's world in 10 years, because 2030 seems a far way off, but is really just 10 years away. They won't exist. Um, <laughs> in that year what advice do you have to those choosing a career young persons whether they are moving from grade 9 to grade 10 choosing subjects or they are moving on to university or some training institution what advice do you have to them in choosing a career in making themselves marketable what is your advice for me to be complete computer literate. For me, I'm happy that the new PEP exam is bringing in, there's a, there is an, there is an area that they call critical thinking because we don't think these young people with the multiple degrees, is few of them think, they cannot think, they cannot think on their feet simple task, even to add one and one, they have to draw for a calculator. So the, what I'm trying to say, in my experience, Mrs. Patterson, yes, sir. is that they have to learn to think, okay. they have to learn parents, you need to see that your children read, parents, you need to help them because there was a program once upon a time, a changing world by Earl Nightingale. 
And we are living in a changing world. That was the name of the program. A changing world, okay. Well, we are changing. And we're not changing in, 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 in years, you know. We are changing in moments, okay. right? So we have to be, the, first of all, you have to be loyal to what you do. You, if you don't like what you're doing, don't do it. You have to be interested in what you do. And you have to develop this kind of attitude to be loyal. You want to come to work, work begins at eight. In my experience, work, our work begins at 7.30 to four. And I'm there at minutes to seven. And at four o'clock you take off your bag and you go and you're not mindful of what is left to be done and you go and tomorrow you're not feeling well and you're not mindful of what is undone to tell somebody that you know I didn't get through this to this customer could you tell them so and so so we have a lot of things that we need to tell our children or young people we have to work hard. Success comes in the dictionary before work, but you have to work hard to be successful. Thank you so much, Sister Zimini. So computer literacy, um, working hard, um, being loyal, loving what you do. Grow with the times, because we are moving and moving so fast. Um, I could say in, in well, I, I am not out there learning in the technical, in the computer field, but the young people who are there now, they are, they are going to take over soon and they are taking over soon. And as I said, it's changing times. So you have to grow with the times, Go with the flow, do your research, what is out there, what the jobs will be in the future, and you just tap into that. Okay, I just remember Mopsy. <laughs> when I, when nobody wants Mopsy now, so the design of clothing yeah. is, has changed. It has so you changed. can't make not Mopsy yes, for anybody now. Because um, I remember no. Anything, if you want styles, you have to go online. Because I remember some time ago when I was looking books, I couldn't get any books. And so um, I realized that I have to go online now for everything. So everything, somebody came to me some time ago and said, let me see your books. I said, my dear, books is obsolete. They're not here anymore. So what you want to do is to go online and look something, and then we can work from that. So, okay, yeah. okay. Right. okay. As the Bible Thank would you. say, where there's no vision, the people perish. <laughs> All right, um, you know, I remember when I was going to school to do diagnostic, I said to one of my friends, come, make we go do diagnostic because based on what vehicles do. He said, technology can reach a height and then it come back down. I guess like what clothes reach fashion and change. And right now, it's like when he has anything to do, he has to come to me because he can't manage it, right? So you have to be a thinker. You have to observe what is happening. I remember when I used to like, overall vehicles and themselves. I have to call somebody how to start it. And I said to myself, what else is there to learn? So I go out there and find it. You know what I mean? if, if you even look in our industry, right? There's no recycling going on, basically. And there's a lot of things disposing. You understand me? So you have to look what is happening around and just basically grab onto opportunities as them come. There's a lot of things. In, in my era, when I started to do, I learned diagnostic, like about 2000, and then I started to read, like 2005, and I started to read a lot of books pertaining to it. I realized like, the technology was like about from 1985. But because we are not, we don't know. Nobody in, like, it's like when I was going to school and basically and say, I would do mechanic. There's nobody to say, all right then. I think physics and chemistry is two best subject to go along with that. Okay. There's nobody that teach you that. You understand me? But while you grow, you will see. Don't look at mechanic as basically, what I say, clean the hand, clean money, dirty hands. Because a lot of people shy away from it because they say it's dirty. But there's a clean side to it that nobody does. Your, every vehicle now is making with smart key, with technology. 
you have a vehicle that is not driving properly and it's a software problem. You just want to upgrade. There's a lot of things happening out there. So you have to just adjust to what is happening changes. Okay. So we are getting a lot of advice this afternoon, um, brethren, about adjusting. So the new normal is here. And we are not even so completely aware of where it will take us, what it would actually be. We are yet to learn everything about the COVID-19, but, uh, and how it will affect our lives, maybe two years down the road, five years in the future. We are not completely aware of it, but what we do know is that we have to adjust. And before I let go of my panelists who have helped us so well, one lesson from COVID-19. What lesson have you learned? One lesson. One lesson from COVID-19. One lesson. I am saying it every day. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. This gospel of the kingdom is to be preached as a witness. Look, the evangelists and the people who are talking about evangelism, they have a task. Because simple people are threatened by not adhering to COVID-19 practices. They don't care. So how are they going to be inclined to say there is a God you must you must listen to what he says. How? They don't want this thing. If you catch it and you're not up to scratch, you will die. The king, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached for a weakness. It never say you're going to listen. So I am very, very sorry for the evangelists in my time. Because these people are not listening. So what you have learned, Mrs. These people don't listen. Them don't listen. That is why they won't come to the Lord. Oh Lord. All right. One yeah. lesson, Sister Spencer. Okay. Yes. Is that true. Yeah. Um. That everyday life is not certain. Tomorrow, um, you 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 are here today. You wake up tomorrow morning. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust your mind to face a new day every day. Every day you have to. Okay, so you have to be flexible and yes. willing to adjust. Yeah, and willing to adjust, willing to learn, willing to accept teaching. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Brother Patterson? As I would say, um, the things that you hate the most always come to haunt you. Because you know, the first I tell you that I didn't like mechanic work, but is it, the, it is the same one that saved me during COVID. <laughs> Okay, so even if you don't like it, you can find. But haven't you adjusted, Brother Patterson, from transition from mechanics to diag diagnostics and so on? So you are so you are adjusting and reshaping yourself. I have to do it. Okay. If I don't do it, I'll die. <laughs> and uh, you know, somebody told me today. My husband told me today. If you if you don't, if you can't cook, don't open a restaurant. If you can't cook, don't open a restaurant. What does that mean to you, anybody? If you can't cook, don't open a restaurant. You have to know what you're doing because yeah, you open a restaurant and somebody can put anything out there on the table and tell you that this is, this is what is good. And actually when your okay. customer come in, they know that they don't come back. Okay, so you have business, to know right? your business. You have to know your business, yeah. Yes, Brother Patterson? I would say, um, as what I do, I make sure that when I'm setting up appointments for jobs or whatever, I make sure that I set it. If a staff tell me that they're not coming tomorrow, I can do it. You need to know what you are doing because the staff must turn up tomorrow. Okay. Now, you have heard it, brethren, in person, online. So much to learn. But if you are to reshape for the new normal, you have to 
be critical thinkers. You have to be computer literate. You have to be willing to learn and unlearn. And most of all, direct everything you do to our Heavenly Father because he sees all, he knows all, and he cares for all of us. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm now gonna turn over to Sister Shirley Richards as she introduces this part two of this afternoon's program. Thank you, Brother Patterson, Sisters Ziminis and Spencer. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It is my pleasure today to introduce to us our very special presenter, guest presenter for the afternoon. She's Elder Lori Daniel, a member of the Phoenix City Seventh-day Adventist Church in Phoenix City, Alabama. She's, she has quite an impressive business career. However, after spending 20 years in a successful business organization, she launched her own business consulting organization so she's now the, a coach and CEO of Next Level Coaching and Consulting. Sister Danielle is an internationally known speaker. She has traveled literally across the world presenting at conferences. She has been to places like Kenya, Cuba, Ireland, St. Kitts and Nevis, and all across the United States. And we are fortunate today here at Washington to have her presenting to us on the theme, Reshaping for the New Normal. In addition to all of her success, career success, she finds that her biggest accomplishment is, in, is as a co-parent for her three sons whom she shares with her loving husband, Ray Daniel. Her favorite scripture is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you can see exactly why she has had the success that she has experienced. Please listen attentively as Sister Lori Daniel presents to us at this time. Can you all hear me? Amen. I'm so excited to be here today. You know, Pastor Atkinson was just here a couple weeks ago, and he mentioned casually that, you know, sometimes we're going to have you speak to our church. And one thing I've learned about Pastor Atkinson, because he was my pastor as well, is that when he says something, he means it. I had no idea it would be this soon, but I am pleasantly surprised. I thought I was going to be there in person laying on the beach, but instead I am here virtually and I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I would like to open with a word of prayer, so please join me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for just your Sabbath day and the opportunity to talk about uh, this new uh, element that has come into our environment and Lord, how we adjust, how we respond to it. And so Heavenly Father, I ask that you uh, be with each of us, Lord. I ask that you speak through me now. Uh, may I decrease and you increase and Heavenly Father, may people and all of us have ears to hear. We ask this in Jesus name, we pray, amen. Well, I think the panel did a spectacular job. They really did my job. I think uh, hearing from the, the folks that are in it and living in it gives you some of the best advice that you can ever get. But what I'd like to do now is just give you some actionable things that we can do in this new environment. Because as we said here, uh, some of us never thought that we would be furloughed, for example, meaning we uh, still have a job, but you're on hold. And oh, by the way, we're not paying you, or that we have a job, but oh, by the way, we're gonna decrease your pay. 
we would have never imagined that this month, this year, that we would be laid off. And frankly, we weren't prepared at all for it. Not to mention graduates who find themselves in an environment where jobs are few and candidates are in abundance. And so this is a environment at this time that had not been anticipated or expected by most folks. Now, just to give a little context to what's going on in Jamaica in terms of COVID, um, and you may have stated this already, but I'll restate it in case you didn't. Um, so far, there have been 1,082 confirmed cases, that's as of today, and 14 deaths. And I must say that Jamaica is doing a, a, a far better job than we are here in the States. Uh, 14 deaths, some 56% of those confirmed cases are females. And so we see that it is disproportionately affecting females and 44% are males. And the age range is from two months to 87 years. So here we are, brethren, we're faced with an invader in our environment that is not a respecter of person, is not a respecter of age, and it is deadly. So how does that impact us? How does that impact our careers and our jobs specifically? Well, the industries that are most negatively impacted would happen to be one of the industries that's very near and dear to the heart of Jamaica, and that's the tourism industry, has been extremely impacted negatively from cruise ships to resorts to retail shops to hotels. All of these uh, areas of focus have been negatively impacted. In fact, 25% of all Jamaicans are employed in tourism. So that's one out of four are employed in tourism. But there is a light. Some industries, as our panel discussed, have been positively impacted. One is the grocery industry. Um, people still have to eat. And in fact, um, not only do they have to eat, but what we experienced here in uh, the U.S. was people were beginning to hoard food. And so you go into the shops and shelves were empty. You know, I don't know what the obsession is with toilet paper, but toilet paper was gone. Um, paper towels gone from shelves. And so the grocery industry has benefited uh, extremely well. The other industry that has benefited is technology. You know, all of a sudden the digital world, we were already shifting in that respect, but it has accelerated. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So the new, new normal is a greater mix of virtual and in-office operations as it refers to careers. And also an acceleration of the digital environment. We also see in the new normal increased safety measures at work. I think one of our panelists talked about the fact of the difficulty in getting compliance with some of these new regulations. And in fact, there are whole industries um, already that existed before COVID that worked to get employees to comply with safety measures. Um, so masks, sanitizing, of your hands, social distancing, change of clothes, all of these things now are a part of this new normal. So having set the context, what I'd like to do now is talk about five actions you should take right now if you have been impacted negatively or if you're just in a state of just not knowing what to do in life. And the first one is Use every disruption in your life as a spiritual checkpoint. I'm going to say it again. Use every disruption in your life as a spiritual checkpoint. COVID is a disruption. Any crisis is a disruption in life. So what do we do for a spiritual checkpoint? I'm going to invite you at home, in person, get a pen, get a pencil, get some paper, take some notes. Spiritual checkpoint. I'm going to go over these five things. I'm going to move quickly because I think I have only 15 minutes. So prayer. The first thing is, are you praying? This is a spiritual checkpoint. Are you praying? When do I pray? How often do I pray? And I want to get a little deeper into prayer. So I'm going to just leave it at that for now. Praying. The next thing is, am I reading my Bible daily? 
When am I reading it? How often am I studying, not just reading? Three, am I surrounding myself with people who love the Lord and are seeking to follow him? That's very important. Do you know how impactful your peer group can be to you? Just have to look in the pages of a Bible just a little bit and look at men like Solomon and all the wives that he had and how soon uh, he fell from worshiping the one and only God to worshiping idols and putting up idols in the mountains and the high places for his many wives. He fell based on his peer group's influence. And so who is your peer group? Who's influencing you? Am I intentional? Number four, am I intentional about consistently helping others? Ministry. Am I consistent? Do I, am I deliberate about helping other people? That's ministry. However you do it, am I doing ministry? The fifth checkpoint is, do I share the gospel? Witnessing. Am I telling anybody about Jesus? Am I sharing the good message at all? So brethren, I would say these five spiritual checkpoints, that is a starting place. And it is a starting place because right now in a crisis, in a disruption, you're in a situation where you need guidance. And so I want to backtrack just to prayer just a little bit because it's not just pray. It is a specific prayer that if you're not praying this prayer today, you need to begin immediately. And that is the prayer for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Why the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit was left to comfort us. The Holy Spirit was left to give us direction. The Holy Spirit was left to guide us, to lead us unto all righteousness. And so every day we must get a fresh anointing, a fresh grace of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did it every day. And if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Amen, somebody. So prayer, asking for the Holy Spirit. If ever there was a need for prayer, it's right now. You know, I won't go there, but I'm going to give you Luke, 9, uh, Luke 11, 9 through 13, where Jesus tells us to ask, ask, ask. He says it about five times, I believe, ask. Ask, you have not because you ask not. And then he gets to the end and he says, if you want the Holy Spirit, you must what? Ask for it. And so you're at a time in your life where you need direction, you need guidance, and you need to be sure that it is God's will in your next steps. And so that's the first action you need to take. Do the spiritual checkpoint. Number two, seek mentorships and sponsorships. Two verses I'll leave with you. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Proverbs eleven fourteen, 14, where there is no counsel, the people fail or fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. At this time in your life, this is a time for you to seek mentorship and or sponsorship. Now, let me explain just a little bit there. What's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? I think the Harvard Business Review said it best. A mentor, while a mentor is someone who, is, who has knowledge and will share it with you, a sponsor is a person who has power and will use it for you. I'll say it again. While a mentor is someone who has knowledge and will share it with you, a sponsor is a person who has power and will use it for you. And I like to put it very practically as I sat in boardrooms with um, the president and the CEO and other senior vice presidents and chief of staffs, the sponsor is the person that in the meeting, when your name comes up, will say, you know what? I know that person and I'm willing to stand for that person. I'm willing to put my reputation on that person. That's your sponsor. Your mentor is the one who has knowledge and will share it with you on an ongoing day-to-day -day basis. Now, they may be one and the same, but that's the difference. But you have to now go to your existing network. Who do you know in the industry that you want to get to or at the company that you're in? Reach out to them, not to ask for a job. And I think this is a mistake that is often made. You know, who do I know that I can ask for a job? Who do I know that can get me promoted? Not to ask for that, because those calls are a dime a dozen, I have to tell you. But ask for advice. Update them on your status and seek advice. 
on what you might do, how you might approach it, bounce something off of them and get some input from them. That's how you begin to tap into your existing network. Also, you have to build a new network. If you don't know anyone, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open a door for you and then go introduce yourself to someone. And this is why we start with the spiritual checkpoint because you have to get through that list because you are depending on the guidance of the Holy Spirit to work miracles, to open doors that seem closed, to, to, to part rivers that seem that they would block you. Introduce yourself to someone and let them know what you're trying to do and see if they will be willing to give you some advice. That's number two. Number three, practice having executive presence. What's executive presence, you say? In a nutshell, it's inspiring confidence. Forbes magazine, Forbes magazine says it the best, I think, in its simplest terms. Executive presence is about your ability to inspire confidence. Inspiring confidence in your subordinates, that you're the leader they want to follow. Inspiring confidence among peers, that you're capable and reliable. And most importantly, inspiring confidence among other senior, senior leaders and others that you may be going to for a job that you have potential for great achievements. Now, how in the heck do you do that, you say? I tell you that it is really all about how you speak, how you sit, other body language, such as looking people in the eye, what you say, and making sure to say something. You know, in this day of virtual meetings and uh, phone conferences, it makes it very difficult to exude executive presence. However, one thing to keep in mind is that when you are in a meeting setting, make sure you say something and not anything. Make sure you add something of value to the discussion so that when they leave, they know that you were there. And most of all for executive pr uh, presence, listen, 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 because the more you listen, the more you know how to respond. It's not about talking, trying to fill the dead spots with talk and chatter, but listen. More about executive presence is controlling your emotions, understanding the emotions of others, being self-aware, realizing when you're talking too much. Have you ever been around someone that just literally will not hush? They literally will not let someone else get a word in lack of self-awareness. Be aware of people tapping their pencil when you're speaking, people rolling their eyes, people looking around. Be self-aware of the impact that you're having on others. This is executive presence. So that's number three. Also, as a part of executive presence, remember, you don't have to look like what you're going through. Um, you may have financial difficulty right now. Um, you may only have a dime in the bank, but your face does not have to show that. Your presence does not have to show that because God is a God of what will be. And he allows us to walk in that light of our future state. So think about how you are presenting yourself all around as it talks about uh, executive, death, executive presence. Also, you don't have to act desperate because you feel desperate. Remember, you are a royal priesthood and that if God be for you, who can be against you? These are the things that you have to give yourself in terms of self-talk as you think about exuding executive presence. Number four, be persistent. You know, it's easy to get discouraged when you lose your job. Business is not coming in. I heard the sister say that she was a dress designer and all of a sudden orders aren't coming in. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get discouraged when you can't find a job or maybe you don't get the promotion you had your eyes on. In times of crisis, it's easy to look at the physical evidence of your situation and give up 
or throw the towel in. The killer of persistency is focusing on what it looks like. But our God is not a God of what it looks like or what it feels like. You see, because it, it looked like Daniel was going to be eaten up by the lions when he was in the lion's den. It looked like the three Hebrew boys would be burned up in the fire. But God is not a God of what it looks like. And so we must be persistent and not discouraged by the physical evidence. Instead, we must be persistent and resilient and focus on what it can be. What can I do differently? Can you make lemonade out of the lemons of life? I love the example that was given um, in our panel about switching from making clothing to making masks. Excellent. I'm still using the same skill set I have, but I'm listening to the demand of the market and I'm seeing that the former demand has decreased and this demand over here is increased. I have the skill. Let's do it. I know several other clothing designers that went into mass making. Another thing uh, I've heard of the, of the larger industry, which is interesting, the alcohol industry has now many of them stopped with alcohol or making much less alcohol and they're making, guess what? Hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. And those cells are outpacing the alcohol cells. So something good is coming out of COVID, amen. And also in persistence, don't be afraid to take a risk. You know, you've heard the same before. If you continue to do the same things, you're gonna get the same results. And that's kind of the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing and expecting what? Different results. Take educated risks. Uh, take a, uh, a time to do things differently than you may have done in the past. You know, God even encourages us to be persistent. I would have you look at Luke 11 verses five through eight. And in that passage, God encourages us to be persistent with him. He gives an example of going to your friend at midnight and asking for bread to feed a guest that came to your house. So get this, you're going to your friend when at midnight, you're knocking on the door and you're asking for what? Bread. The friend says, hello, I'm in bed. I'm asleep. My children are with me. I don't have any bread to give you, basically go away. But the word says this man continues to what? Knock. So ultimately, his friend gets up. And it wasn't enough that it was his friend to get him out of the bed, but it was the fact that he was what? Persistent. And then God goes on to tell us in the scriptures to be persistent in asking for the Holy Spirit. So that's number four, persistency. Number five, freshen your resume and your skills. More than ever, it's critical that your resume is on point and reflects your assets to the company. What do you want them to say about you after reading your resume? Frankly, I've seen thousands of, of, of well, hundreds, I would say, of resumes. And, um, you know, there's the resume that will actually grab your attention. And then there's the resume that will just say, okay, I don't know what you're saying or really why you applied for this job. What's your resume saying? What message are you getting across? Go through it and make sure that message that you want to get, I want to get the message across that I am a strong, um, I have a strong work ethic, that I have a lot of experience in um, computer science. Does your resume get that across? So now you say, what if you don't have the direct skills for the position you're looking for? So we talked a little bit on the panel about the fact that we're having to change and adjust skill sets because sometimes I may have an outdated skill, but now I see a position that I'd like, I just don't have the skill set. So what do we do? Well, we have to acquire new skills. And some of those areas that you may wanna think about acquiring new skills in are app programming. Making apps, you know, that's the same. There's, is there an app for that? Apps is really a place where if you have a penchant for technology and for programming and math, that's a great place to go. 
digital marketing. You know, there are a ton of baby boomers right now that have businesses but aren't as fluent in the digital world that would love to have a consultant or love to have someone do that for them. Data analysis, because we're all on the computer, so much data is being generated. And guess what? People have to analyze that data. So if you're good with numbers, data analysis, law, new things are coming out you know, very quickly. So patent law, things like that are new skills, new areas that as you look into the future are going to be very relative. Number two, if you don't have the direct skills that for the positions you're applying for, volunteer. You know, I, I didn't have at the time a, a sponsor or a, a mentor to tell me this, but I had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided me uh, many years ago before I ever got into management to open up a daycare at our church. And so our church um, had a great building and we felt that there was a need for a daycare. We wanted to open up one, but there was no one that would manage or direct the daycare. And so the Holy Spirit nudged me to go ahead and volunteer to manage the daycare. And so I did. I managed the daycare. And mind you, prior to this at work, I had applied, applied for several management jobs. I got my master's. I was ready to get into management. And the word that I got back was, you don't have any management experience. Well, after I did this, a job came up and I said, well, I wonder, can I put down this volunteer job? I'm going to put it down and see what happens. Guess what? I got an interview. If you volunteer, and I'm sure there are plenty of jobs at church that you may be able to volunteer for, that is very a very viable candidate to put on your resume if it fits what you're looking for. And so because I had director of, of the day here on my resume, that allowed me to get my first management position. So I didn't do it with that in mind, but the Holy Spirit used it to open up a door for me. So volunteer if you're not getting hired. The next thing you can do if you don't have the skill set, there are at least five attributes that employers are always looking for. And you should focus on those five. The first one is initiative. James 4, 17 says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If you know to do good, do it. That applies to life, that applies to work, it applies to relationships, it applies to everything you can uh, think about. If you know to do good, do it. Don't wait for someone else to come and tell you to do it. Don't wait for someone else to ask you why you didn't do it. Do it if you know to do good, take initiative. The next one our panel also talked about and that was problem solving and critical thinking. I totally agree with our panel. We are in an environment today where we are not challenging the individuals that are coming out of our schools with critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, being able to work through problems and, and, and come up with an optimal solution at the end. It says in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your own understanding in all thy ways do what? acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So we know as Christians that when we problem solve, that's the first place we go. We ask for that direction. We ask for that guidance. But what you find is happening often in the work environment is that the employee will come with, I'm going to call it a monkey. That's the problem. A monkey on their back and they come in your office and they'll say such and such and such and such. Did you know this was happening? And they feel very good because they have, rightly so, identified the problem. And guess what they just did? They took the monkey off their back and now they put it on whose back? Your back. And now they're walking out of your office feeling pretty rightly good about themselves. But that's not what we want from employees. That's not what employers want. They want employees that are going to be able to critically think their way through a problem. And if they need guidance, if they need help, if they need to bounce ideas off of someone in doing that, so be it. But don't take the monkey off your back and give it to someone else. The next um, attribute that employers are looking for, team player. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, 10, 9 through 10, 
Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Do you lift others up? Do you care about their success? Or is it all about me? Are you able to help someone else when they seem to be struggling? Or do you just try to get to the finish line and then worry about, let them worry about themselves? Team players are critical in any successful business. We work together. We're better as two than one. The other attribute that you should focus on is strong work ethic, having a strong work ethic. I also find that this is something that is not as prevalent today as maybe it was many years ago. Colossians 3.23 says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And so strong work ethic means that when you're at the job, when you're at your business, you're not working for yourself, really. You're not working for the man either. You are doing it unto the Lord. Now, that should put a whole new meaning to the work that you do. It should give you pep in your step. It should give you a, a better attitude. It should give you a bounce in your stride because you're doing it unto the Lord. Heartily means three things. One, putting in the time to get it done. Two, doing it with quality. And three, overcoming obstacles. I'll give you a quick example. You know, this is strong work ethic um, and overcoming obstacles. I had a presentation that was due about, I had, um, I think, a $190 million budget at the time. And we had a presentation to give to the chief administrative officer at the time. I had a person that was responsible for getting those numbers prepared for the analysis. And when I went home uh, about six o'clock, she was still working on it. I left about 10 o'clock. I'm in bed. I get a call from another employee and said, you know what? Um, this individual does not have the report done and she's leaving. Mind you, our meeting with the, the chief was at eight o'clock in the morning. She's leaving and I'm telling her not to leave. I said, hold on, let me put my clothes on. It's 10 o'clock at night. I drive to work. I get there and there's crisis. She says, I have a number. I can't figure it out. I'm going home. You don't go home. You don't, you, it's not an option. It's not an option that at eight o'clock we have a meeting and we're going to go in and say, we can't figure it out. There are numbers. So when I say strong work ethic and overcoming obstacles, that means that you stay and figure it out. And so I stayed with her. I'm crunching numbers. My other analyst stayed and we crunched numbers literally until 6 a.m. in the morning. But guess what? We figured it out. I ran home, changed clothes, showered, came back at 8 o'clock, and we presented it. I gave her credit. That's overcoming obstacles. You put in the time to get it done, you do it with quality, and you overcome obstacles. That's hardly doing it heartily. And finally, the fifth thing that every employer looks for that you can work on having is a positive attitude. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, what? Think on these things. Why does he talk about what to think about? Because as Proverbs says, as a man thinks, so is he. If you're thinking negatively, if you're thinking about things not happening the way that you want, if you're thinking that you're not being treated right, if you're thinking that I deserve that the pro promotion and didn't get it, it will come out in your attitude. And so you need to train yourself to have the mind of Christ and think on these things that are positives. And as our panel said, be humble and teachable in the meanwhile. Humility and being teachable all go with this positive attitude. Put a smile on your face. Say good morning to someone. Know that God is on your side. And so they cannot control your emotions. They cannot control your attitude because only God is the one that puts this joy inside that they cannot take away. In summary, 
if your career plans have taken a hit because of the new environment we are in, there are five actions that you need to take immediately. One, complete a spiritual checkup. Two, seek mentorship and or sponsorships. Three, practice having executive presence. Four, be persistent. Don't give up. Failure is not an option. Number five, freshen your resume. Please put these things in action. I want to thank the pastor and the host and the church for allowing me to share with you today. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we truly just want to thank you, dear Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And we invite your Holy Spirit, Lord, to in, reside in us each and every day. Lord, we thank you for that even through the COVID uh, experience, there are positives that can come out of it, Heavenly Father. And even through the COVID experience, Heavenly Father, you are taking us through it. And so, Lord, we thank you for your protection. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for this church who's had the foresight to minister to the needs the real needs, the real relevant needs of the people today. We ask for these continued blessings as we look forward to the end of the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Much. Thank you so much, Elder Daniels. We were spellbound as we listened to your presentation. We have some persons who are, who have sent in their questions. And while we get those questions together, I'm going to invite a, a, a song at this time by Sister Shuyan Simon. Thank you. And then Elder Daniel, we will come back to you with our questions. Amen. Whenever there's a wind in my sail 
Thank you so much, Sister Simon. I know the master of the wind. And we know he can calm every storm. Now we're gonna to go to our questions. Um, welcome back, Sister, Sister Daniel. We're gonna to go to a couple of questions that have been posted in the group. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Elder Daniel, what counsel would you give for unemployed graduates? Yeah, for unemployed graduates, I'm assuming is that college or high school, it, it really, I guess, doesn't matter. Um, again, looking at your skill set that you have now. Uh, particularly if it was college, you know, what was your major in college? What were you attempting to do? Looking at the environment right now, and if you're unemployed, I'm assuming that you're applying for jobs, not getting them, or that um, there are no jobs for you to apply for. You may need to reassess your skills um, and, and see if that is going to be beneficial for you now. Or as I mentioned before, you may need to reach out to your network. Uh, with some mentors or sponsors. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move on to the second one. How do I make my presence felt at work, whether online or at an interview to help me stand out? Yeah, and so, you know, in our virtual environment, it's, it's difficult now. A lot of interviewing viewers are using Zoom and Skype and other things. And so, again, that executive presence that I talked about, and that is about instilling confidence in other people that you are reliable, that you have the potential to do what they're looking for. And it's a lot in how you speak, how you carry yourself, how the tone of voice things like that, that you really need to practice on before you get online, before you get in that interview. How am I speaking? And, and you someone, um, and am I coming across confidently? Now there's a thin line between confidence and arrogance. And so you don't want to become or come off arrogant, but you do want to be confident. Okay, thank you. So executive presence i like yes. another question how do i use my career as a service for god oh you know um one thing i found is that um you can almost use any skill set that god has given you and and turn it into service for them that's a pretty general question but i'll give you an example of some things that um, not even a career, but just some things that people like, their activities. In our church here, we started an organization called the Hands and Feet of Jesus. And it was about getting outside of the four walls of the church and using whatever skill set God has given you or whatever um, uh, desire uh, or thing or, or like, I should say, that he has given you that you like to do. For example, we had a fishing team. He liked to go fishing. He said, how can I use fishing for the Lord. And what he did was he got a bunch of men together and some women that liked to fish. They went fishing. They had a devotion before they went fishing. They had a time where they took a trip. They went into a mall and passed out tracks and then they went fishing. But he used that, that skill set, if you will, as an avenue to reach other people. And I would uh, submit that you could use any skill set God has given you in a similar fashion. Okay, thank you so much. Question four, what is a good strategy to make an employer know that I'm interested in, in moving from volunteering to employee status within a particular 
organization without sounding desperate? Yeah, you know, um, the first thing is to really understand the company you're working for. And what I mean by that, um, you're volunteering now and, and you could be volunteering in an internship capacity um, or you could be volunteering because you're just trying to get a foot in the door and you said, hey, I'll just volunteer for now. But understanding the, 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 the company dynamics. And so what I mean is, is the company at a point where they're laying off workers already? And so now you're going to come ask to be made uh, a paid employee and they're already laying off. Or are they in hiring mode? So if they're in hiring mode, I think the best policy is really directness. A lot of times we beat around the bush, but whoever the immediate supervisor is, and when I say directness, is ask the question. Ask the question, are, is there an opportunity, do you think, at this time for me to move from volunteer status to paid status? Plain and simple. Ask the question. Thank you. And our final question. What are some tips for moving from a nine to five to entrepreneurship? I'm sorry, say that again. What are some tips? Do you have any tips about moving from a nine to five job to being an entrepreneur? Oh, to being an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of considerations. Um, the, the, the first one, and, and again, um, questions in terms of what makes the transition easier. Is this a skill set that you're already doing in your nine to five? If it is, that's gonna make it a little easier to transition, or is this a new skill set you're trying to develop? Um, one of the things that I would suggest is if you can, test the waters before you quit your nine to five. So maybe you wanna go into um, bakery and you wanna sell baked goods. Well, can you sell those baked goods on the weekends, you know, on Sundays or create an online store? So sometimes while you're trying to decide which uh, way you want to go, you have to put in double the effort in the meantime. And so I would say to the extent that you can test the waters a little to see one, if there's a need, if there's a market and two, how good are you at it? Okay, we have another question. Go call the men in. Yes. Okay, this question is, what guidance do you offer for persons who are not mindful of their digital footprints? And is its possible impact on employment opportunities or business startup? Wow, that's, that's a great question. In this day and age, if you are not mindful of your digital footprint, it can be very detrimental for your future career opportunities. And I find that often people just, I don't, I, I, you know, for lack of a better word, I just think people aren't thinking. Um, but employers actively look on Facebook employers actively can go out to Instagram. And when they see you on Instagram posed in your little um, bikini and all these other things that you have going on, alcohol, I'm just telling you some of the red flags, the alcohol, things like that. Now they cannot ask you about that in the interview. They're not gonna ask you that, but nothing stops them from looking at the footprint that you leave of your lifestyle and declining to interview you, or after they see that that's your lifestyle, and maybe you had a favorable interview, but when they see this second life, it very well could be the end of your uh, stop with that particular employer. So the advice is be mindful of the footprint. You cannot afford not to be. Okay. Thank you so much, Elder Daniel. I'm telling you, we thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. We Praise thank God. you so much for your time, for the tips that you have given us, for your expertise coming to us. We wish you were actually here with us. We thank you for reminding us of our spiritual check 
and uh, what employers are looking for, like initiative and problem solving and a positive attitude. We thank you. And this quote, you don't have to look like what you've, you're going through. So we thank you for sharing with us here at the Washington Gardens Church. And of course, for all those who are viewing us online. And we really hope that we will see you very soon doing another presentation. We wish for you all the very best in your professional and personal life. And may the God of heaven be with you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope to see you guys in person soon. Thank you so much. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite the person who is responsible for Vespers, Elder Norma Palmer, who will be joining us remotely. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Now, as I listened to this evening's program, I was truly blessed. And I know we've all been blessed. I want to look at this song, 326. Open my eyes that I may see. Three, two, six. Open my eyes that I may see. Amen. This evening, as we listen to the program, reshaping 
We are thinking about the future, thinking about career. We are thinking about new opportunities, the new normal. But many of us may not be thinking about career today. We are maybe thinking how we live our lives, the different changes that are taking place. This evening, I want to leave a thought with you, dealing with change. There is one sure thing you can count on in this world, and that is change. Nothing stays the same. People deal with change differently. So easily and fitting like before. While others dread the mere thought of losing comfort of what is familiar. Some would ask in a situation than to be strange. Change can cause stress, anxiety, and tension. But there's one constant in your life that never changes, and that's God's love for us. He is willing to help us through life's difficulties and earth in our ever changing world. For He alone knows the way, whether the journey is exciting or scary. We can walk with confidence because God is with us. And I promise to never leave us or forsake us. Oh, how comforting is it to that God's love never changes. He loves us to the everlasting love, and nothing will change that love. And as we have the text in Eve 30, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. He never changed. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in spirit, let us walk also in the spirit. And Proverbs 9.69 says, a man's heart plant is real, but the Lord wrecks his steps. Are we going to the undied? We do not know his head because Every day, permanent in school. What we know that love is the process, and praise is he will never leave us, not forsake us. So, other sisters come to a change has come, and change is continue. But if we put our trust in God, we have nothing to fear because he is ready. Shall we pray? It shall fall We want to thank you for this Saturday. We want to thank for your Holy Spirit present with us morning until noon. We thank you, Lord, the little lesson we learned today. Lord, as we go in this new week, we do not know what lies ahead. But we know that He is going before us, and He holds our hands. So, Lord, as we go back, so it will go to us. We ask you to continue to lead us, to bless us. Help us keep our eyes fixed on you. Because you are coming slow, and you told us about the changes that will come. Help us not to be free. But help us to just to come and live in and We ask that we'll go to us all. Continue to bless us, Lord, and help us to trust you. Keep us faithful and poor. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen.
just want to say thanks to all the participants. Thank you so much, host. You did such an excellent job, our presenter. Uh, thank you, Pastor Atkinson, for recommending Sister Daniel. We were blessed. And all the other um, the persons on the panel, thank you so much for sharing. As I said at the beginning, we, ex we hoped to inspire and to share, and we really hope you were inspired this evening. Thank you. Over to... Okay, thank you, and have a good Thank mm -hmm. you. 